So welcome everyone to our fifth interactive series of the 2021-2022 academic year. We're pleased to host this session with a lot of current trainees to answer general questions about the MD and DO PhD interview process. Uh, I'm Daniel Joven. I'll be your moderator tonight. I'm a first year MD PhD student at uh, the Yale School of Medicine, currently in the first year of my MD, and I'm joined by Lynn and uh, Jenny, who can introduce themselves. Hi, everyone. I'm Jenny. Um, I'm also a first year MD PhD student. I'm at um, uh, Columbia's MD PhD program. Um, and Lynn is also our co-moderator, but I believe she's not in our kind of panelist area, but she will be um, live tweeting from the APSA uh, Twitter account. Um, and to introduce our panelists, we have uh, Dimitri Cadet, who's at the UCLA Caltech uh, Joint MD PhD program. If you wouldn't mind uh, waving to show everyone who you are. Uh, we also Hi, have everyone. We also have uh, Maddie Dowling from uh, the Michigan State DO PhD program. Um, and we have Cole Kamney uh, at the Columbia MD PhD program and uh, Sinibaldo Romero Arrocha from University of Minnesota's MD PhD program. Um, and so we'll also be sharing the panelists bios in the chat so you can get an idea of their research interests and, and clinical interests. Um, but first of all, to all the panelists, I just wanna say thank you all for being here. We're really grateful you took the time out of your day, come virtually to our meeting and, and provide your wisdom and, and pearls of interviewing. Um, and like I said, just as a piece of housekeeping in case uh, anyone came a bit late, we're gonna be recording this meeting. So it should be up in about one to two weeks on the APSA website. Um, and so as your moderator, I just want to remind you to please submit your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, we'll have um, some of our panelists answering those as well, and some will also get added to my queue to, to be asked live. Uh, we have a team of co-moderators, namely um, Jenny and Lynn, who will be collecting our questions. Uh, and so you can also ask your questions uh, on Twitter or via their emails, which I'll send in the chat now. Um, I think that's all the announcements I have. Uh, looking forward to get started. Thank you guys all again for being here. Uh, and I'll go ahead and start uh, with our first question. But before we begin, panelists, could you, uh, I guess, just introduce yourself briefly, uh, talk about um, what year you are, what program you're at, um, and maybe what your interests are. And I guess also if you applied in person or, or virtually. And we can start in the order of uh, introduction. So Dimitri, if you don't mind going first. Sure. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Dimitri. I'm at the UCLA Caltech MSTP. Um, I'm originally from New York, but I grew up in Florida um, and I went to Columbia for undergrad. I did apply in person, uh, sorry, online. And I am in person now at, at UCLA uh, as an MD one. Um, and my research interests include oncology, uh, systems biology, and mainly proteomics for cancer bio. Sorry, it's not a bit bad out here. And uh, Madi, if you don't mind uh, going next. Yep. Hi, everyone. I'm Madi. Um, I am a second year DO PhD student at Michigan State University. Um, I did my undergrad here at Michigan State as well, but um, my bachelor's is actually in neuroscience with a minor in bioethics. Um, and I had really diverse research experience um, in a variety of fields and areas before. Um, I took a medical anthropology course in my last semester of senior year, uh, actually after I had already gotten into uh, MSU's DO program, decided I wanted to pursue a PhD in medical anthropology uh, and uh, MSU com had to, happened to have one of those programs. So. I applied and got in and here I am. So very happy to be here. Uh, and research interests are um, kind of in public health and policy, but also um, really specifically looking at psychoactive substance consumption and its impact on um, identity in like a very social and political context. Awesome. Uh, Cole, if you don't mind introducing yourself. 
Hi everyone, uh, I'm Cole. I, uh, I'm originally from Vermont. I went to UC Berkeley for undergrad, uh, where I studied engineering. And then I'm, I'm oh, at Columbia MSDP. Um, and my research interests uh, are generally bioinformatics, machine learning, CS focused, and I'm also interested in access to healthcare and underserved populations. And uh, last but not least, uh, Sinovaldo. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm Sinovaldo. I go by Cine. I'm currently an MS2 at uh, the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis. Um, I'm also part of the NAH OxCam Fellowship, if anybody has questions about that. Um, I'm originally from Venezuela in South America. I grew up there, and I went to college here in the States at North Dakota State University. And then I did my post back at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And then I moved up an hour north um, and I'm at the University of Minnesota. Uh, my research interests are in stem cell and tissue engineering. And I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Well, uh, we're very excited to have you all. Um, and just as a first question, I think people that maybe honestly haven't interviewed before and are new to this whole process would like to know more about what's interview day like or interview days uh, and what's the format and how is it different from how is the format and both the style of questioning different from MD or DO only program interviews uh, and, and anyone feel free to speak up to answer that. Um, I can start. Um, I would say I interviewed in person, so this might be a little bit different. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is the length of the interview. For MD-PhD interviews, it usually lasts uh, two to three days, uh, which is very different from MD interviews. They usually last for just one day. Um, I think the focus is a little bit different as well. Um, every MSDP is different. Um, so I think you see a lot more variety when you go out there for any PhD interviews as well. Um, I also think the focus is different. Some institutions are, are, have divided the interview and you can clearly see the difference between the MD part of it and the PhD part of it. And in some programs it was seamless in the sense that, you know, you could see a mix all throughout the three days. Uh, so I think that's a great start um, to this question. Yeah, I would just uh, totally agree with that. Um, the MD PhD interviews tend to be a much longer interviewing experience. So uh, I would say most schools are two days, a few or three. Um, and a few will try to stuff everything into one. Um, and on the interviewer side, the your, your MD interviewers will be much more interested in your clinical experiences or why you want to go into medicine. Um, your PhD interviewers, I don't want to say that they don't care about that, but they're going to be much more interested in, in your research interests and how you want to carve out your place as a physician scientist, uh, and just to get a sense of your commitment to that pathway as a whole. Uh, and some schools do a much better job of integrating those two and keeping them, keeping them sort of integrated in that whole physician scientist philosophy. In other schools, you'll see that they're really two separate tracks that you'll find yourself in in their program. Um, and you just have to decide which style you like more. Um, yeah, I think for me, I, I had a really, really um, untraditional path to the dual degree program um, kind of from the beginning. Um, and so I um, won't really speak too much about that uh, at this moment, um, just because I, I don't think it'll be really helpful to anybody just besides, um, you know, reach out to your resources. And it, even if you feel like you, you know, applied one way or another and change your mind, um, you can apply after, you know, you can reach out to people afterwards and they might um, accommodate you. So, you know, don't be afraid just, you know, just because you like missed the deadline or, you know, aren't, you know, like, don't feel like you're following the rules. Don't be afraid to communicate properly. And that's something that you'll find is really important is um, strong communication is really important. 
Um, and just something um, that I kept in mind when I was interviewing was every school that I interviewed to, um, I made kind of a word doc with a, like a summary of um, their mission statement, their like demographics, their population, like just general information about their school and then um, questions that I had. And then, uh, you know, just so you have questions that I had specific to the school, but then general questions to prep, because a big thing is, you know, having questions to ask them during interview, because it shows that you're really interested in their program and that you've researched their program and that you're knowledgeable about it. Um, so that's something I would really recommend is before you go to interview, um, really research your um, program. And this kind of gets back to what Dimitri was saying as well about knowing um, where you're applying. Um, and that's definitely really, really important. On that note, um, another question that a lot of people have is with regards to how to prepare for interviews. Um, and so I think it'd be great if you guys could share how you guys prepared um, and kind of what methods you heard other people did or, or work for other people like doing mock interviews uh, and maybe any questions that you um, found were, were really common or maybe even ones that surprised you a little bit that you, you wish you were ready for. I guess, uh, Cole, if, if you don't mind starting. Yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. So I think um, I would kind of split it up into, um, as other people mentioned, but like MD and then the MD, PhD or PhD interviews. I think for the PhD interviews, like, you know, you want to be nice, you want to be friendly, um, all those things help, but you also, you really want to know your research. And I think, yeah, you know, sometimes you eat and breathe and sleep and you focus only on research and it's like, you know it, but sometimes if you have a project a couple of years old or whatever, go through and review it just so you understand what you know, what was the point of that project, I think is really key and what you did and what you would change or whatever. And then for MD interviews, I think there's a lot of good resources out there. Um, I felt that some schools had like MMIs or more classic M MD inter interviews. And I think preparing for those and kind of getting a sense of what um, they're looking for in that was helpful um, because I felt the MMIs were pretty formulaic at, some point. Um, I'm sure other people can add. Yeah. Um, I can jump in. Uh, kind of as Cole was saying, um, for me, like knowing whether the school does MMI versus, you know, like formal questioning or what kind of style the interviewing does um, is a big part of um, being familiar with the school you're going to and applying to. And so that's really important. Um, and then I think I'm the only uh, DO person here. So I'll speak a little bit about uh, DO specific interview questions. Um, they really, really do stress that, you know, why do you want to do DO? And, you know, what, like, do you, what part of the osteopathic tenants do you um, really, um, you know, kind of, I guess, what part does it, what part of that tenant vibes with you? You know, they kind of really want you to um, have a connection with that um, osteopathic philosophy because that's something they really incorporate into the curriculum and um, the way they teach in a way that's really different from um, MD curriculums. And that's something I've really noticed um, speaking to uh, friends who are in MD programs. So if you're interested in a DO program, um, please feel free to reach out and also um, really, you know, it, it, there is a difference in terms of what they're asking for. Um, in that philosophy question. Yeah, those are great points. Um, I want to give you guys a, a pearl of wisdom that I received when I was applying. Um, if you think about performance as an interviewee, um, when you start, you're going to be a very unpolished product. And as you move towards the middle of your interviews, you're going to be at peak performance. You're going to really feel comfortable in your groove. But sadly, inherently, as you move towards the ending of the process, you're gonna be very tired of this whole process. So I think the timing of your, your interviews is very important, which institutions do you select to interview at first in the middle or later, um, I think will play a role in how you perform in those interviews. Um, so for example, I think personally, and I hope this is not too controversial, uh, my top institutions, if I could, I selected them in the middle of my interview cycle. Um, because I can generally tell you that the first couple were not <laughs> ideal experiences. I was still learning the process. I was learning how to how to interact with PIs in a different environment, how to get a, um, my science across. And you get a lot of feedback um, immediately or afterwards from professors, faculty, et cetera. Uh, so you will learn as you move as you move 
forward, but I think a lot of students are um, rushing to interview at their top choice in the first place. Um, but I think that's a little kind of productive because of what I just said. Uh, so I think that's something someone told me and I really appreciated it. And now on the other side, I think that's something you should think about it too. Yeah, just to add in like a Zoom specific advice. Um, in general, just scope out a place to sit before your interview days uh, and try to draft a, a document, just like quick questions that you can ask of your interviewer. Like it's a question that we've received. Um, questions that not only show your interest in the school, but also maybe the interview as, interviewer as a person, because a lot of these schools are going to have you select your uh, research faculty that you'd like to speak with. Um, and if they know that you selected them, it, it, it's helpful to A, know why you selected them and B, have questions for them that are that go beyond what's maybe posted on their lab website or uh, somewhere on the, on the med school website. So questions like, uh, why did you choose the school that you're at now? Where are you coming from? What drew you to the school? Um, and what do you find most captivating about the school? Uh, these are questions that not only show that you've thought about where you want to be for the next seven, eight years of your life, uh, but also show that like you're invested in the process and you're not just coming in to sit on a Zoom call for, for the day and get out of class. On that note, that uh, brings us to another question that had um, kind of come up from our registrants. How much time, I guess in general, did you spend preparing for interviews and interviewees in particular, like reading up on them, maybe uh, learning about their work or their interests? Um, and what type of preparation and questions do you think are necessary to do well in terms of uh, figuring out if the program is a good fit and also kind of leaving a good impression on uh, your interviewees? Uh, Dimitri, if you don't mind, I guess, expanding on that, because you brought that up a little. Sure. So at the beginning of the process, I spent much more time on each school than at the end of the process. I, I think that's sort of the natural trajectory of, of the season. But in general, like you can plan to spend one or two hours just looking at like a, a program's website. Uh, and I, I really wouldn't spend more than 10 or 15 minutes on any one uh, PI or, or, or research faculty that you want to interview with. Because at the end of the day, you have to choose one school. And if you're interviewing with five different people from each school and you have 10 interviewers, you can't realistically go through 50 people's bodies of work. Um, so you can just like look at the website feel get a feel for what they do and what they what they are interested in and ask yourself are you interested in that or could you see yourself wanting to be uh, a rotation student in that lab um, i would spend more time thinking about the questions you're going to ask that relate to uh, school environment and, and just like research training medical training things like that because uh, those can be more formulaic for each school but you don't really have to tailor to 10 schools. Um, and yeah, I just, like one to two hours is, is pretty solid for the middle of your interview cycle or the end. Um, I was gonna say this isn't necessarily, um, kind of social sciences are a little bit different than um, I feel like the, uh, like the, the hard sciences in terms of the interview process. So I, didn't actually interview we just sort of sent in like you know documents and, and portfolios and stuff like that um but i think something that i heard from uh, a friend of mine who was in the neuroscience graduate program at msu was that um the grad students during you know the grad students the current grad students will take out the applicants um to like social hour or lunch or dinner or whatever and um these grad students actually have a say in whether you are accepted or not so um being able to be sociable and um not you know like oh i know i'm gonna get in so you know i'm not gonna talk to anybody here like you will not get in if you come in with that attitude um and that is a fact so 
you know, being really, you know, having that social game is really, really important in this application process. Um, and, you know, no, and, the, and that kind of goes back to this interview thing where, you know, you have to be able to read your um, interviewer. So, you know, if it's someone who you think is a little more serious, you know, you want to answer seriously, you, you might not want to joke around with them. But if it's somebody who, you know, kind of gives off a little bit more of a, you can mess with them vibe, um, there's nothing wrong with, you know, showing your personality a little bit um and show it and making sure that you stand out that sounds awful and making sure you stand out but you know leave an impression i guess is what i'm trying to say um and the, again to the question about what are some uh questions to have you know kind of in your back pocket one that i really liked for um and this would be more for current students if you're able to talk to any um would it be if you were able to go back would you make this make the same decision um is a is one that i kind of kept in my back pocket because I think it, it gives you a lot of insight and I think um, it gives you a little more, um, a deeper look into the, maybe some true true uh, musings of the current students. So um, those are my two cents. Yeah, I, I think that's great. Um, for anyone that couldn't make the session two weeks ago, um, one of the, program directors mentioned that it, at one interview back when things were done in person, uh, a taxi driver came in and like came to the um, administrative desk and talked about how the student in his, uh, in his cab was saying how he could never live in the city and this interview doesn't matter to him. So, um, you know, the, the interview lasts the whole day and, um, you know, obviously you, don't want to think like that in the first place, but definitely make sure how how you communicate. Um, I guess um, just staying on this topic um, a little bit more. Um, what were the questions that you thought were gave you the most kind of insight from from your interview day? Like uh, Madi mentioned, um, asking about. Of students rethinking their decision, or I guess when talking with faculty as well. Uh, and in general, what were the questions that you heard most often, or are like the questions everybody should be prepared to answer? Uh, Sanibaldo, if you don't mind starting us off. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think as um, people applying to MD-PhD programs. The first one is obviously going to be, why do you want to pursue a double degree? Um, you have to have that speech down and it has to be hopefully peer reviewed by then. And what I mean by that is, hopefully you run that speech by you know a couple of faculty, mentors, et cetera, your APSA mentor, your PI. Um, and, and that will come, in variations. Um, and I think that's something that surprised me a little bit is you will get pushback on the things you say. If you say, you know, I feel like I see myself doing this and that, people will tell you, you know, what if that fails? How will you deal with that? What if you don't like medical school? Why don't you just do a PhD? Why don't you just do an MD and then do a fellowship or something? So be ready to, to very gently and respectfully defend your position and if possible show, you know, support your claims. I have done research for five years. I do not see myself doing anything else or whatever it may be. Um, but I think that's, those are the basics. Why do you want to pursue a double degree? Why not just one or the other, et cetera? Uh, I think when it comes to science, something um, I think I see a lot of mentees struggling with is how to share their science. Um, people will just vomit this background information to you and you'll be like, okay, but you know, what was the hypothesis? What did you actually do during that experiment? What were you hoping to accomplish with that experiment? So I think a helpful exercise is when you're practicing, make sure you're addressing those things and make sure you actually say them because I think that's helpful. My hypothesis was um, the experiments that we did were, the results were, and then after that, the future direction were. Um, and I think having a logical flow um, that you can go back to during these interviews would be very helpful because the last thing you want to do is sound like someone who just did the work because they were told to. Um, because someone told me, and I will never forget this, is we're trying to accept um, future clinician scientists, not technicians. Anybody can do the work. Like, can you think through the work? 
And I think that was um, very insightful into what they were looking for. I hope that helped. I think that was a, a nice summary of most of my thoughts and put more succinctly than I could have. Um, but I think to add to the kind of what kind of questions do you ask, I thought, honestly, I can't remember what kind of questions I asked in gen like the general program and stuff. I think, you know, you're going to be with lots of other people who are going to ask questions and then you'll think of something or you write something down. Um, and I felt it was, I was always curious to see, you know, what does their mission say? What are their, you know, what are they trying to put off as an idea, like the, as a kind of their culture of the school? And then how do the students respond to that? And how do they feel about it? And then how do the faculty feel about it? Because I think every institution is different. And every institution will have some kind of disconnect, but understanding if that disconnect is something you want or you don't want but is important. And I think that's purely for your own understanding. Like, you know, I wouldn't probe too hard during an interview, but after the, you know, when you're talking to students, if you're like, do you really enjoy this? And they're like, no, listen to them because there's a reason they're saying that. And I, I no, nobody said they didn't enjoy it, just so, but yeah. I actually had somebody tell me during uh, my interview season that she used to match with kids who came to town to interview and then on Tinder and tell them don't come here because it sucks. <laughs> so I don't know. Different kinds of experience. Yeah, so listen, to to those listen to the attendant matches. But um, kind of on that line, I guess, you know, talking to, I guess, like, I, I'm really a big fan of talking to upperclassmen and resources that you have. I'm, I'm a huge, huge advocate for that. Um, that's, I would say, my big, my, my biggest strength and have been, has been my biggest resources and supports, um, support system for coming in. Um, and so I actually, my undergrad research lab, um, is the uh, research lab of two students in the dual degree program at, at uh, our program. So I knew them very closely and I uh, talked to them before my interview. And, you know, one of them was like, ask about this specifically. And um, it was about uh, something to do with like a 60 year clerkship issue that was currently happening and happening administratively. And so he was like, you need to know what's going to happen with the program and what's going to happen to you. So you should be, you know, ask like, what's is this going to be resolved? Um, and I actually brought it up during my interview and the uh, director was like dying of laughter. He was like, I've never had anybody ever bring this up to me um, in an interview, but I think it left an impression. So, you know, you talk to your resources, talk to um, people who you can, um, you know, and I think we've kind of represented a, a wide number of schools here. So if you, you know, can talk to uh, even, you know, us at, as panelists, but I think a lot of schools have current student lists. So if there's a student who is in a program that you're interested in, you know, feel free to reach out because a lot of us are really happy to receive those emails and, you know, help those are, that are interested. Yeah, just quickly adding on, like, the faculty have been there sometimes for a very long time. And I think one of the most helpful questions that I found myself asking was, you know, what are the biggest changes that you've seen uh, while you've been at the school and what changes do you foresee happening? That can be a question for the MSTP director or your interviewers. Um, and that just gives you a sense of like where the school or the program is headed as a whole and what their mindset is on training doctors and physician scientists. And is that a place you want to be? Yeah, I think uh, those are all great points, and particularly in terms of changes, um, some schools regarding their funding and, and how they want to expand the program, getting insight into that can be really valuable. Um, I just wanted to make a quick uh, announcement since we're about halfway through our session. Um, our, just as a reminder, our session is going to be recorded, and we right now have a team of uh, co-moderators, uh, Jenny and Lynn with myself, who are we're gathering submitted questions via Twitter and email and also in the Q&A box. So please, we really encourage you to um, send in any questions you may have. Uh, it's a great opportunity to have you know, a, a broad group of current trainees answer them for you and, and give you insight. Um, so any and all questions are welcome. Uh, again, and that's both on the Zoom and, and on uh, Twitter and, and via email.
and I'll send the emails again in the chat. Um, something that we kind of touched upon but didn't fully you know, delve into is uh, what kind of recommendations did you all have for talking about your research? And I understand this kind of varies with the type of research you did, but um, you know, that question of tell me about your research is, is pretty common. So what did you guys find was a good amount of time and depth to answer that question with initially? Uh, and how did you address limitations in the project or your role if maybe you were kind of assisting a grad student or a postdoc rather than um, working on the project only independently? Um, and I guess I'll start with uh, Cole, if, if you don't mind. Yes, of course. Um, so I'm kind of trying to think about it. So one of the things that I because um, I'm, I'm purely dry lab and I, I did um, genomics research for my gap years. And I felt one of the biggest things for that was understanding what goes on in the wet lab, having like a you know, very, not basic, but a, a medium level of understanding. I don't need to know all the techniques, but just because I think I got a lot of questions on like, what is this? Because I think sometimes I would get assigned interviewers who weren't purely computational and I needed to be able to talk their language. And that was um, really key is understanding the steps in your research. I, I'm sure that most people do a large section of like, you know, the whole process, but understanding anything that's not outside of what you directly do is really good. Um, and then I think in terms of talking, I found that, you know, it depends on how much research you have and what you were doing, but I felt like minimum five, 10 minutes was key to talk about the stuff I did and what I felt was important and the goals of the project. Um, and sometimes interviewers would give you, you know, a half hour. And I, I never felt like if you get super excited about your research and you're talking about it and you're talking about the goals, and you know, it's going to come off in a good way because it excites you. Um, so I, I wouldn't worry. I wouldn't try and, you know, stick to two minutes or something really short because you feel like you have to. Um, and I, I think gauging what your interviewer feels about that, if it seems bored, maybe and make sure you're letting, giving them time to interject. But um, I, I think timing, you know, use as much time as you can. And then I don't, was there a second part to that question? Um, it was mainly just kind of how to, how in depth to go and then how to address any limitations in the project itself or kind of yeah. um, any blind spots in your role for, for stuff you maybe weren't involved in as directly. Yeah, yeah, I think for understanding limitations, I, I think that's something that I found prepping beforehand was important is saying, like, what would I do differently if this was my project or if I got you know $10 million to do this? How would I change it? Um, and I think that rarely, you know, I didn't get any questions like, what would you do if you got $10 million? But it helped me understand those other parts a um, lot. And then in terms of, you know, having outside, like basically, you know, being part of like a grad student group or something, I'm not really sure. I didn't get a ton of questions on that. So I, I think I'm gonna give a wrong answer there. So I think I'm sure the panel can, yeah um on the question of like how much time to spend talking about your research i think it really depends on you and your interviewer um some of the interviewers will like cole said talk for half an hour about your research in particular uh, some of the interviewers will pull up a slide deck of their lab and talk at you for 30 minutes. So it, it really depends on how much you can get in. Um, but as long as you're you know, passionate about your own research, I, I think it'll shine through. Um, and on the question of, sorry, what was the second question? How did you address any, I guess, limitations in the project or talk about research where you were involved, maybe more as a research assistant rather than, than driving the project yourself. Right. Uh, I think you definitely need to be honest with uh, everything that you answer. 
because they can sense if you're sort of being duplicitous or, or straight up lying. <laughs> so if, if you didn't do something, I would give credit to the person who did. So I, I had one question on whether I thought of a, a solution or my PI thought of a solution. And I, I told the interviewer directly, like, there's no way I could have thought of that. But once my PI suggested it, um, I sort of worked it up and, and did the follow through on my own. Um, and I, I think that interviewer really appreciated that I didn't say, oh, I spent hours in the, in the library looking through manuscripts from 1980 to solve this one issue. Um, so if, if there's a limitation or, or something that you didn't work on directly, I just say it. Like, there, there's no shame in that. Um, and, and be clear about the things that you actually did do. Uh, and that all goes to contribute towards your trustworthiness, your, your, your feeling of being genuine. Um, I can kind of talk a little bit about um, sort of how my research talk went, um, because I um, just to give briefly some background, um, when I came to MSU as an undergrad, again, neuroscience major, I joined a sleep and learning lab um, uh, in the psychology department, and then I transitioned to a neuroscience um, radiology uh, research lab looking at Alzheimer's and hypertension, and then I actually went abroad and worked at a, a research lab there. Um, in like it was got kind of a wet lab. I've never tried wet lab before, so I wanted to try wet lab. Um, and then uh, finally, I decided to do medical anthropology, which is something completely different. So I really had to sell the, the, the fact that this wasn't a last minute decision, that my research experiences had led up to this, that my path made sense, um, and that I wasn't just doing things on a whim. So, you know, I and for me, um, my current interest in, you know, like the interaction of health and the social circumstances and um, especially substances we consume it because it's something a lot of times we don't think of them as substances, for example, like caffeine. Um, those interactions um, are something that I saw a lot from a neuroscience and biological perspective, but I saw the importance of, you know, that social aspect that a lot of times I think tends to get ignored in um, medicine. And so I wanted to really be able to talk about that and bring that aspect in um, and talk about more um, things that affect Kind of population level health um and so i really needed you know being able to talk about what made you for me at least um what made me want to pursue each type of research because even though they seemed very different they were actually sort of connected um and and i did have a reason why i chose each of those research experiences for each of those research labs um so tying that narrative together um in a way that leads you to where you are today and why you want to do that physician scientist program is really really important Yeah, I think those are great points. And to echo what you guys said, uh, Dimitri and Madi, um, I, I think you even if you're a research assistant on a project, just because you didn't submit the grant or order all the reagents or do the pipetting doesn't mean you don't understand every figure in the paper or understand why things were done a certain way. So if you can communicate that uh, while still you know, being upfront and truthful about your involvement, um, I think you can still do a great job interviewing uh, and, and definitely, you know, you have your your PI probably writing your letter uh, as well as do your significant research experience essay. So um, kind of having a consistent story about your involvement will always be important. Um, and then I think you brought this up a little, Monty, that it's always good to tie in your research experiences to the broader story of why you have your interest now, why you want to be a physician scientist. And if you can communicate about kind of the nitty gritty of the research and also the big picture and um, your story and motivations for your career, I think you know you can do a really good job interviewing without having 10 first author papers to give a hyperbole. Um, so uh, shifting gears a little bit, it is um, this, this interview process is starting to pick up a little bit. I think a lot of people are anxious playing the, the email slot machine so in general, um, what was the timeline like for, I guess, getting your interviews and interviewing? Um, when, and when did you receive interview invitations? Uh, and kind of how did you manage the waiting? And, and do you think there's anything to really interpret from the timing of interview invitations or, or number of invites by the new year or, so, or something like that? 
uh, Saint Baldo, if you don't mind starting us off. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, when you get your interviews, it will be depending on when you submit your application. Um, I think it goes without saying that the later you submit your application, the smaller the chances are that you will get an interview in a given program. Um, I think um, that's actually a great question to ask during your interviews, especially with the program director. You know, what are the steps to follow after this interview? How long will I wait until I hear back from you? Um, and I think for that, it will greatly vary by programs because some programs wait until they interview the very last candidate and then they make the decisions. And some programs will be offering offers as they get interviewees. Uh, so those are very two very different approaches. Um, I don't know. I think I was so busy <laughs> um, and so caught up in flights and getting ready for interviews and working that I, I really wasn't that anxious, um, you know, thinking about offers and such. Um, I would say um, I was I was very lucky and very fortunate to get a couple of acceptances under my belt, even as I was interviewing in other programs. But to those of you um, who don't, um, I think there is always hope until the very, very end. I have colleagues and friends who got acceptances in May, like they were moving to one medical school and they got a call and they ended up dropping that rent and going to a different state in the road, like on the road, like it was crazy. Um, but it's important to, at the same time, be realistic. Um, so I think the outcome of this is um, communicate openly with your programs. You know, if, if you are very interested in a program, let them know that. Uh, obviously, don't say that to every program, like just say that to the program that you're interested in. Um, and don't lose hope because some, sometimes things happen and life circumstances and such uh, will give you opportunities even if it's at the end of the road. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. And that, that's one thing that at the very end, you know, if you are really interested in the program, make sure you let them know. I think some program directors will tell you straight up at the interview, they want to hear that. Um, I've heard from other program directors that in private, that's also what they look for. And I think it, you know, do it for schools that you are interested in, of course, don't send them everywhere. But um, that was one thing that I didn't really realize. And I think differs from MDs is that they're very receptive to that kind of um, communication. And I think in terms of interviews, um, I think they start, I guess, um, starting in September, I think, you know, all the way into January and February. And I think with, in general, I don't, I didn't really see a trend in, you know, timing wise, what was, you know, whether that led to an acceptance or not. I think some schools do it by interviewers coming in or who they really want versus not. And then some schools also been by research types and whatnot. Um, so you might show up on a day and everyone's doing this kind of research. But one thing I would say is if you have the chance to out schedule your interviews, make sure you schedule them in a way that you kind of rank them in importance. Because um, when I had like a couple interviews in a week, it was exhausting. And I felt like going into that last one, I was just like, I was lucky that that wasn't my top choice. Or it was, it was, and it was, I was a train wreck at that point. So I would say, if you get the chance, look at your schedule and try and plan. Uh, if no one has anything they want to add, um, a question that came up in the chat was, you know, did you guys find that you were being asked questions or had to be knowledgeable about kind of current events, particularly with regards to COVID or healthcare policy or, or general healthcare news. I know that COVID questions were kind of um, everywhere on secondary applications, but in your interviews, is that something that came up or uh, was something that you felt like you needed to be knowledgeable or prepared about?
My parents, no. I mean, I, I didn't. I didn't think I was too caught up with COVID, but um, no one asked like you know a lot of specific details about COVID. Um, I think with in terms of you know the current state of healthcare and what's kind of happened, being knowledgeable, but you don't. I don't think anyone ever expected me to be an expert on that stuff, and, and my research was very far from it. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I would say I never had to be knowledgeable on COVID, either like the biology or social effects. It did come up naturally in some conversations where I would, you know, ask about a specific program and the interviewer would say, well, we used to do that, but during COVID it changed to this or it stopped. Um, on healthcare policy, I will say from several of the PhD interviewers at, at many different schools, some of them will test your commitment to the physician sciences pathway by bringing up uh, how doctors are sort of paid and reimbursed. And I, I, I think it's something to be aware of because of the state of funding of, of, of academic research and, of, and the state of funding medicine. They're two separate systems and you sort of have to spend time in, in both worlds to completely understand that. Um, and I, I think they were just trying to emphasize that this is, is, is a, a path that requires a lot of balancing uh, and competing between your two interests. Uh, so I, I think the best way to answer those questions is, is to be knowledgeable on healthcare policy and, and funding in general. You don't have to know specifics, but just be aware of that. And um, since we're ending soon, just to wrap up with uh, one or two more questions, um, this was kind of touched on a little bit, but in general, how did you guys approach kind of communications after the interview, both in terms of um, reaching out to interviewers or reaching out to programs and program directors more broadly, uh, particularly um, kind of before getting a decision back and then maybe even after getting that? Uh, seeing Baldo, uh, you know, my starting us off. Yeah, I think um, for me, if memory serves well, it feels so long ago. Um, I actually asked um, each faculty member I interviewed with for their um, business card. And I said, hey, if I have a, a question to follow up or whatever, um, can I email you after this? And I think 99% of them said yes. Um, and I think that's something that is interesting because you don't understand it when you are at that point. Um, you're obviously being interviewed, but at the same time, these are faculty members who are looking for grad students. And you could be a potential grad student. So if they connect with you in that interview, you will be a potential grad student the year after. So if you make a really good impression, they're technically vetting for a potential student, which I think in my mind changes the dynamics of how these relationships develop. Um, but yeah, basically I, I got a business card and then I think um, my rule of thumb was the day after my interviews, I would send them an email, something that I really appreciated our conversation and said, you know, um, hopefully I get a chance to be admitted and in the future, maybe we can talk about a potential rotation. Uh, for program directors, I would say, you know, the highlights of my day, um, what I really like about the program and obviously that um, I'm interested in, obviously, in, you know, potentially joining their MD PhD program. Um, I would say for me, it was always about like asking because I know a lot of programs have different rules about whether they like or not to be contacted after the interview because there's like hundreds of you guys. Um, so yeah, I think the safest bet is to ask what their policy is because um, we can be annoying because <laughs> if you have 500 students emailing them over and over, thank you for the interview. Like obviously you don't want that. Um, so I always just wanted to make sure that that's something people were comfortable with. And um, yeah, I think an email would suffice. I'll just add like 
that thank you emails is a great idea for your interviewers and program directors. And also don't forget the, uh, like perhaps the office secretaries who set up the interview day, especially over Zoom. You'll find that some schools still don't have Zoom down pat <laughs> and some schools do a really great job with Zoom interviews. And a, a quick email to like the, the MSCP office just saying like, thank you for well-organized interview day, uh, had so much fun, blah, 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 can go a really long way. I, I want to second all of that. And I think a good reminder is that like, whether you choose these schools or not, whether you get in or not, like it's a very small community. You will probably see these people again and you want to be nice. Thank them for their time because they are putting in a lot of work for this. So just, I think you know, it doesn't hurt to be nice to everyone. Um, I was going to add to what uh, Sinibaldo was saying um, about, you know, once you kind of talk to, um, for Anthro, we don't really have labs so much as kind of an advisor that you work under um, whose research and experience is sort of similar to what you're looking for. Um, and for me, uh, the professor who was actually teaching the course um, was the person that I felt was would be the best fit for me. Um, and so once I communicated with him and, you know, expressed my interest, I was, I had the benefit of being able to do this in person um, because I had him obviously, but um, even if you're virtually, I really recommend, you know, trying to set up Zoom meetings, um, communicating and saying, you know, I'd love to meet for a virtual coffee hour, get to know you, something like that. Um, because that fit that he was, um, Simbalo, Simbalo was talking about is really, really important. And once you get an advisor on your side, who's like, I really want this student, that's your golden ticket because <laughs> I mean they're the ones paying for you right um so if, if you have a boss that wants you um they're going to support your application that goes a really long way because that that's exactly what happened to me um we had a lot of kind of administrative problems where they weren't really sure um whether they would be taking any more anthro dual students but um my advisor really really fought for me and I was able to get in um because of that so you know that kind of communication with people who would support your application is really, really important because you need people who will fight for you on that application, you know, team and discussion committee. Committee is the word I was looking for. Well, um, I recognize it's getting a bit late and I want to be respectful of all of your time, but uh, we have one last question in the chat, if uh, you guys don't mind that we get to that. Um, and so, I was wondering whether so the question is how would you recommend talking about maybe research experiences or any kind of experiences or activities students were involved in um, that didn't go well that maybe had more conflict or um, just overall weren't um, you know flowers and, and sunshine how do you guys talk about those experiences that were not ideal or less than perfect and, and what's the way to approach that for an interview when um, those types of experiences get get brought up um, I guess Cole if, if you wouldn't mind starting this yeah off. yeah so I think that's a it's a very good question and it happens and don't feel bad about it happening it happens far too much in research and I think um, I think there's a couple things that go along with it is you know talking to your peers and not necessarily your closest friends, talking to your parents or your parents' friends or whomever who might give you a more objective perspective and saying like, trying to understand, you know, sometimes I've not gotten along with people and it's been me, but most of the time I'm gonna assume it's the difficult PI or whatnot. And then also if you can talk to any MD or any PhD or PhD mentors and see what they say, because they are gonna give you really great insight into what their generation or their group of people will think because I'm not gonna, you know, I'm gonna respond differently than a faculty member will and or someone our age might respond differently. So getting that extra insight is a good idea. And then I think making sure to be, you know, when it comes up, if it comes up, talking about it in a very respectful manner and being like, you know, this is trying to don't put, the other person down don't you know keeping it in a positive light and saying like it didn't work out and that's okay and and I think there's there's a lot of stress with that um it actually happened to my girlfriend and it's really stressful um 
but I think her being able to talk to MDs and MDPhDs about it really helped her go through it because they gave insight that, and, and even for a specific school and specific faculty, they were able to just um, tailored insight to her situation. I think it also kind of depends on the extent to which it kind of shows up or affects your application too. So um, like I had I had um, lab experience that I was in for the first two years of my undergraduate um, and then I moved on to other experiences, but I really didn't have a good experience with the PI there. Like we don't, she just gives, ugh, still gives me the heebie-jeebies. Like I don't like her um, and she wasn't a huge fan of me. And you know, like what, it's just something where like I had other things that I could talk about and that's more, you know, what I emphasize. And um, it, it really sort of depends on what I think the experience is because if it's your prominent lab that you drop or like you dropped out after like six weeks of this lab, then obviously, you know, you, that's something that you have to explain on. It's like having one bad grade. It's like, you know, something you have to explain but something clearly happened. So, you know, I think having kind of a reason like Cole was saying um, and being able to get that perspective is important, but also, um, you know, maybe it's not important to bring up if it's not something that is recent or a big part of your predominant research. Um, if it's something that happened a long time ago, you don't, there's not really a need to even talk about it. Um, but also if you do talk about it, being able to talk about how you um, moved past those complications and how, you know, you were able to um, per deal with these um, conflicts in a professional way is uh, a really good uh, like spin on that because um, that's something these conflicts are something you're going to continually encounter so you know I was able to you know I, I had a professional conflict and I worked it out this way you know is, is a good way to talk about that I feel like. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's great advice to kind of approach talking about it as a learning experience and uh, kind of a way that you demonstrated your ability to handle disagreement in, in a professional way. Um, so thank you guys for staying on uh, a little bit longer than we originally intended. Uh, it, was, it was awesome having you. Um, and thank you to everyone for joining us for our Q&A session today with, with current trainees. Um, I want to thank our panelists again for their time, all our uh, participants, um, both for joining us and, and your great questions uh, and making this so interactive. Uh, and I also uh, need to thank uh, the APSA Diversity Ad Hoc Committee, the, the PR Committee, and, and the Partnership Committee, along with um, Gabby, Eunice, and, and all the APSA leadership that not only helps us put these sessions together, but works to make sure uh, students underrepresented in medicine and, and student groups underrepresented in medicine uh, kind of receive word about it and uh, notice about it as well. Uh, for everyone still on, we're in the process of planning our calendar for more upcoming interactive sessions, both about um, dual degree and physician scientist training in general and also about applying. So stay tuned via social media and um, our email or your email. Um, and I would suggest keeping this Thursday block at 7 p.m. Uh, Eastern open if you can. So thank you all. And, and I hope this was uh, both helpful and, and enjoyable for everybody.